Thanks to all of you for coming today. We're really going to have a, a great conversation, I think. Um, you know, this panel explores the importance of grit, purpose, and related factors in raising happy, healthy, and successful children. Scientific literature has shown that a sense of purpose is correlated with better health. It's also shown that grit and, uh, and self-control predict academic achievement. Yet our conventional approaches to education rarely account for these attributes and characteristics. So today we're going to delve into these characteristics with a little more depth and see how they're connected to success. But we'll also explore whether they are teachable, learnable, whether you can develop them, and how you can use big data in measuring these attributes more effectively. So we've assembled an impressive panel here, and I'm going to introduce them very briefly uh, one by one. Um, so starting way to the left here is uh, Dr. Vivian Ming. Uh, uh, Vivian is a neuroscientist, technologist, and entrepreneur, and was named one of 10 women to watch in technology by Inc. Magazine. Dr. Ming is the co-founder of SOCOS, which applies cognitive modeling to align education with life outcomes. She's also vice president and distinguished scientist at ShiftGig, where she explores how to build job markets that drive long-term economic growth. And Dr. Ming is former chief scientist at Guild, an innovative startup that builds better companies by unleashing human potential in their workforce using machine learning. Uh, I would encourage you to go to socos.com, and I can, around after, we can give you the, the, uh, the, the say that again. Uh, it's a very fascinating news application there that really can uh, help you uh, in further developing your child. And, and so it's a fascinating app. I encourage you to go there. Uh, next, in the middle, uh, Dr. Vic Strecker. Uh, Vic is professor of University of Michigan School of Public Health. He founded the University of Michigan Center for Health Communications Research and is director of innovation and social entrepreneurship. He also started Health Media, Inc., which provides digital interventions for health promotion and disease prevention to millions of users. And Dr. Strecker recently launched a new venture called Jewel Health, um, which de uh, developed an innovative uh, mobile and web-based application to facilitate purpose-driven health engagement. And he's got a, a great book, just came out recently. I'm going to hold it up here, uh, Life on Purpose, really well done. I encourage you to, to, to take a look at it. And it's, I think it's on sale at the Aspen Bookstore. And finally, to my, my immediate left is Robin Koval. And Robin is the CEO and president of the Truth Initiative, which is a national organization dedicated to creating a culture where all youth and young adults reject tobacco. She's co-founder and former president of the Kaplan Thaler Group, which she grew from a fledgling startup to a billion dollar advertising agency. Ms. Koval has won numerous awards for communication, leadership, and entrepreneurship. And she co-authored several best-selling best books with Linda Kaplan Thaler, including From Grit to Great, which was recently published and is available in the Aspen Bookstore. And she'll do a book signing there at 4 p.m. today. So, so to get started, you know, I, I, I'd like to sort of level set a little bit and maybe start with you, Robin. Could you really just, just tell us what grit is and, and, and what is the evidence behind, you know, you know its, its, its value to... To, 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 child, to children and child development? So uh, my co-author, Linda, and I got really interested in grid. As you heard from Kevin, our background, my background is in marketing and advertising. We were running this you know, large, successful advertising agencies. And one of the things that we, we kept hearing is, yes, you're talented. Yes, we love your work. But the reason we chose you is because you and your staff seemed like they were going to work harder for us than anybody else. And we got very interested in this idea of effort versus talent. Um, because, of course, advertising is thought of as a talent industry. And the more we learned about it and got into the research and looked at our own experience and spoke to other people, is, um, is understanding that what is more predictive of success, both among young people and children as well as with adults, is not intellect in the sense of measured IQ, 
um, or what we like to think of as natural talent. You can throw a ball, you can sing, all of those sort of things. Or even financial resources, um, popularity, you're a person that people like. But this ability to harness, and we made it into a little acronym because these character traits are all part of GRIT, of guts, resilience, initiative and tenacity. So that capacity to take on things that are scary. Resilience, understanding that um, a failure isn't fatal and in fact in some ways it's a gift uh, for us. Initiative, being uh, interested in problem solving. And I think the most important part is tenacity. That ability, which is very hard in our 24-7 culture where we all give ourselves a little ADD, um, to stay focused on tasks for the long term. And one of the most interesting things, I think, is we have this sense that the people who we admire in our culture are naturals, um, that they were born with some sort of extraordinary talent that most of us could not have. But if you actually look at people who we think of as the highest achieving in our culture, so Colin Powell was a C-plus student through most of high school. It wasn't until he got into ROTC that he found his passion, so to speak. Or a lot of people don't know that Steven Spielberg was rejected from film school twice. Uh, we all know the story. It's absolutely true. Or we all know the story of J.K. Rowling, who um, I love this quote about her from one of her uh, high school English teachers, that she was an adequate writer. Uh, <laughs> 450,000 <laughs> copies later, million copies later, I should say. Um, we know that she was much more than an adequate writer. So I think the point for all of us, and especially as we think about our kids, is that um, we put so much emphasis on developing IQ. We put so much emphasis on making, you know, will, will my kid get into Harvard? When the truth is that what will actually be more important in your in your kids' success, in our children's success, and in our own success, is our ability to harness and develop these characteristics, which we all can do. We've given 16,000 tests, and the surprising thing is one quarter of people are just naturally really gritty. Uh, about 16% are in the lower two um, quartiles, but most people, two thirds, actually score really well. We just have to learn how to harness it. Yep. So, so Vic, so you come at this with this related concept, you know, of purpose. I mean, it's sort of not synonymous, yeah. but mm -hmm. I would say a related mm -hmm. angle. And uh, you know, and uh, just uh, you know, how did you? I mean, you've done your research in public health and behavior change for for many, many years. How did you come across? The, how did the idea of purpose crystallize for you? And then, what have you? You know, how do you apply it to change behavior in, in people? Uh, well, thank you. Um, I guess both. Intellectually and personally, purpose became really relevant to me. Um, as you were saying, for the last 30 years, I've been helping people make changes in their lives, changes in behavior. And so, like Robin is doing in amazing ways, um, helping people develop better health behaviors. Why? Because over 50% of disease and death is related to our lifestyles. So it's really important to focus on that, but we're so defensive usually. You know, you've all tried to help a friend quit smoking or manage their weight or maybe reduce their drinking a little, and you know, usually this defensive shield comes up. You know, and it's what we call the ego. You know, in science, by the way, 3,000 years ago, it was also called the ego by the Buddha. So you know, it's it's pretty similar. And but the idea is, how can you get a person to transcend that ego? And it turns out that. When pe smokers, for example, are asked uh, to think about their core, most purposeful values in their life, like what do you care about the most, even for just a minute, they become far less defensive. It's like this force field shield just drops. And I've known of no other factor that does this. I mean, we're so used to scaring the crap out of people. You know, and when that doesn't work, we up the fear a little bit. You know, we keep scaring them more and more. We're talking about, and Robin knows about this, but putting like really scary images on the back of cigarettes, you know, like dead people and people with zippers, you know, who are dead and, you know, horrible things. People without jaws or whatever. You see what will happen to you. And most people go, oh my God, that's hor horrible. So, you know, you don't want to scare the crap out of people like this. And we know even neurologically that this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense in the long term in terms of helping people behave change their behaviors. So it's something that I kind of was interested in. And then about six years ago, um, I had a personal uh, 
episode where my 19-year-old daughter passed away. And when she died, uh, she was born healthy and she uh, caught a chicken pox virus and long story, but she ended up becoming one of the first children to get a heart transplant and she lived a big life, but at 19 she suddenly just died. And when that happened, I went through this very deep grieving process and I actually got to this point where I was just eating way too much, drinking way too much and, and just not caring if I lived or not, just to be honest. And I had to come to this crossroads where I asked myself, you're either, you know, do you really want to live or die? You know, we are who we choose to be, so we should be careful who we choose to be. So I thought, gosh, I'm a behavioral scientist. If I can't fix myself, then you know, who else can? So I started reading more about purpose, and I read Viktor Frankl. And uh, Viktor Frankl went through three concentration camps. He ended up noticing that all of these prisoners there would often lose purpose, and then often they'd get sick and die afterwards. And he basically said, look, you have to maintain purpose in, under the most dire circumstances. And that book really taught me a lot more about purpose. Now, by the way, in the last 10 years, there are hundreds of articles related to purpose, behavior change, resilience, uh, the loss of defensiveness, and even people with a strong transcending purpose. If I care more about you, then it turns out that I do better myself. In my own students, I noticed that they're amazing kids, amazing, and they're struggling to find purpose. Mm -hmm. And yet so many of them follow what the Cardassians are doing, more than they're following what their loved ones are doing. They care more about a Miley Cyrus twerking video than you know, what, what they need to do. So helping them create greater purpose and meaning in their lives and direction in their lives is really my job. Um, like as a professor. Purpose is something that happens to you rather than something you do <laughs> exactly. out of the world. Yeah. So yeah, so Vivian, so if we could just transition to you now. So you have a very interesting story around your own sort of uh, uh, grit, I would say. And, um, and, uh, and then you've done extraordinary things with that. And now you really use these concepts um, in, in the context of big data, big data analytics, machine learning, to really apply them to develop children. And I just, if you could kind of explain for the audience what, what you do, because it's, it's pretty remarkable. I should say, first though, I had a professor, an undergrad in a creative writing course. It's the first time she'd ever taught a course for undergrads. She, after our first assignment, we'd written our essays. She stood up in front of the entire class during her lecture and said, some of you have the potential for competence. <laughs> that was the most positive thing she could muster to share with the class. Um, I, and it was interesting because while I was a student there, I was well on my way to flunking out. So I've been told my entire life I was going to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, my father had had this amazing uh, intellectual history, which had never been fully realized. He grew up on a farm in Kansas and, and came so far, but always felt like he'd never come far enough. And, you know, I had this pressure. I was, I mean, I was told I'm going to win a Nobel Prize. And somehow I'm also going to be an amazing athlete. Uh, you know, you got to be everything. Um, and I nearly flunked out of high school, and then I did flunk out of college, because I wasn't those things. I mean, maybe it was there. I, everyone knew I was smart, but no one could get me to do any work, but me least of all. Um, and my life crashed out. I ended up living in a car um, in, in California with no job, never having done anything with my life. And there's another story there about those low points. Um, but I made a decision at one point to take a, a phrase from my father, to live a life of purpose. And let me be clear, that was a substitute for being happy. I could not make myself happy. So I thought, then the purpose of my life is going to make a dif making a difference in other people's lives. So I'm not going to, I'm happy to talk about all that, but I'm not going to dwell on it. All I will say is, it took a long time to crawl out of that hole. So just making that decision didn't magically fix my life. Um, but I slowly got a job at a convenience store, managed a convenience store, eventually saved up enough money to go back to school. And the really salient thing there was after flunking out, I had to start from scratch. 
I did my entire undergraduate degree in a single year and got perfect scores in every class. So I was the same person at the same school studying the same things. But to borrow a famous line, it's not what I was doing but why I was doing it that really mattered. Um, this ties into purpose, it ties into grit. The most impressive thing I've ever done in a life that, if I may say with wild arrogance, has some impressive things in it, is that I kept going for about 10 years before I was really happy. So now, what do I do now? Um, well, I, I analyze big data, I analyze brains. I'm a theoretical neuroscientist turned entrepreneur, and in one of our last companies, we built a database of 122 million people. And we were looking for the things that predicted not simply career success, but the quality of work that people did. Mm -hmm. And grades, standardized test scores, had absolutely no predictive validity at all. Um, what we would find is the best moment for looking at someone and understanding who will do the best work, who will be the most successful, is find the moment where it doesn't matter. Find the moment where all the incentives disappear. What do your best, what do your salespeople do the day after the end of the sales cycle? Wow. What do your engineers do when the product is already ready for release? Who's booking sales? Who's making changes when there's no reason to? If anything, maybe your VP of sales will get mad at you. Well, it turns out when you look at 200,000 salespeople, when you look at 11 million engineers, you see over and over again that it's the people that do it for themselves. When all the incentives go away and it's only that, as I call it, endogenous motivation, they have a purpose for what they're doing, um, they are invariably the most successful. So this led me, to, to just wrap it up, to a broader piece, which is I'm certainly well aware of this amazing literature about all of these forgive the wonky language, but constructs. Um, purpose and motivation and grit and problem solving and creativity that have been shown to be predictive of the life outcomes of little kids. And we're finding it right here as the same thing in 40-year-old salespeople and 20-year-old uh, software developers in the world's best skateboarders. And, uh, and it's so that they just appear to be universals. Mm -hmm. And looking at them at massive scale made me think, great, now how can we actually uncover this? I mean, it's one thing to say that it's there, but how can we discover this at large in the world population and then do something about it, make an actual change? So, you know, these concepts, you know, grit, what we call grit today, which is, you know, stick to hard work, tenacity, you know, goal-oriented, purpose, you know, they're really not, they're not new concepts. I mean, you go back to Aristotle, excellence is a habit, Plutarch's lives, these are the characters of, of great men in those days, but you know, at least to the idea that there was character matters. Uh, you know, why is this, how did we forget it? And why does it appear so novel to rediscover it today. I mean, I, it just seems like, oh, wow, would you quit? I never thought of that. <laughs> well, you know, I think um, we do know that, right? And it's the foundation on which our country was built. And yes, if you go back to the beginning of time, then the whole notion of hard work and effort is important. But something happened kind of in the 60s and the 70s. If you look at the birth of the self-esteem movement, which, of course, came out of all the right intentions, but started shifting the focus from effort matters to telling everyone that they're special. Um, you know, I had fun because I won because I had fun trophies. And um, I mean, even uh, this is a, um, a, a real uh, story that was told to me about a mom who was criticized by the other moms when she wanted to play musical chairs at her kids, little kids, birthday party because everybody loses in musical chairs except for one person. Um, and, 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 you know, think about that. What have we, you know, now told a generation of young people is that uh, it's more important to have, to win, to have fun than to actually work hard. When we know that children do better, not from telling them they're smart or telling them they're special, but by getting them to appreciate 
the effort and to understand how do you excel in life, not by these qualities that are perhaps not changeable. We get the DNA that we get. Um, we get the parents that we get, but rather by these qualities that we all can control ourselves. We all have grit. Um, and so, so I think it is something that we know. It's always been a part of our culture, but somehow we got off the right, pa off the right path. And the good news is, is that we can change it. Um, we can, you know, one of the things that... Well, I do think, though, that idea, we can change it, that's m much newer than it has been yes, in the past. that people do didn't believe that you could change these qualities, but you actually can, mm -hmm. and it's simple, and these are practical so things that we can teach So you were born with it, or maybe you had it or not, <coughs> and so I think what, what we're hearing classic... from you is you can intervene now, and you can give somebody purpose? I mean, somebody, I mean, how... Well, do... I think purpose is a little bit different here than grit, in that um, I think people had purpose for a millennia, but it was given to them by somebody else. Mm -hmm. It was given to them by their the king or queen or pharaoh or khan or whoever it was. And if you said, well, I don't like that purpose, well, you know, you, you didn't last long. So that, that was the case. And then you move through the Gilded Age where you're all given a purpose, given a job, given a role, and you learn from very often your, your parents or other people who were your mentor, and they taught you that kind of grit, and they taught you that purpose. And then suddenly, and Nietzsche talked about this, he warned of this, Emil Durkheim in his book Suicide warned all about this. He said, as we modernize, we'll start losing our purpose. And as we lose our purpose, Durkheim said, we'll start killing ourselves. And Nietzsche said, the scariest thing in the world is to now suddenly have to pick your own purpose. You know, if we are who we choose to be, we have to be very careful who we choose to be, but you know, then it's terrifying to choose who we're gonna be. And most of us just say, you know what, instead of doing that, I'm gonna choose to kind of be like Kim Kardashian. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's a huge problem. So do we have problem. a crisis of purpose today? Is there a sort of yeah. a gross national purpose deficit? Look good on Instagram. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I, I think the question so we, is, yeah, go well, go, no, 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 no. So, so Vivian, would you say that yours, can it be any purpose? In other words, in other words, does any purpose have a, does it have to, in other words, you know, being, you know, uh, climbing my Mount Everest or, or being the first in your field or being rich seem like fairly self aggrandizing so purpose a, or do you need a this noble is the purpose? purpose expert but let me offer my own observations uh, partially from my personal yeah. experience one yes a purpose that's bigger than yourselves you read a statement a, a story about someone having a purpose and achieving before students engage in an academic exercise yeah. and those students will score half a grade higher on the exercise. Yeah. Just that simple manipulation. Um, but two, I have never seen anything, I've, I've seen lots of claims, but never anything that says that purpose has to be a noble good. No. I, if it can be anything, then why shouldn't it be? Right. But look at Michael Jordan and Bill Gates. Their purpose, to my reading, is clearly about competition. Right. They're driven to be the top. Yeah. And boy, has it served them well. Yeah. Um, about Vic, what do you think on that? What do you, I have a little different opinion sure. about it, and, and I think it is, there is some research on this where, for example, they've asked people, actually at the University of Michigan, write down your self-enhancing core values. And by the way, purpose is really just values operationalized, sure. values with goals set to them. Uh, so, and by the way, none of the University of Michigan college students had any problem doing that. And then another group, they had, it was a control group, just write down your daily routine. The third group, they said, write down um, your val core values that relate to empathy or support or community or love. And then they said, here's a bowl of cookies. Have as many cookies as you want as you're taste testing them. And the researcher <laughs> left and, and the people who were in the control group ate eight cookies. By the way, eight cookies? Are you kidding me? Um, one sitting? I asked my students, do you have no self-control? And they go, no. Um, and, and then I said, and then the people writing down their self-enhancing purpose, what, uh, what Aristotle called hedonic purpose, uh, they ate five cookies. And then the group writing down their self-transcending purpose, what Aristotle called eudaimonic uh, well-being or purpose, they ate only 2.8 cookies on average. So, I, and actually there are a number of other studies that I won't bother with, but it does suggest that 
All values are not the same, all purposes are not the same. And when it comes to, for example, climbing Mount Everest, I have a nuanced view of that that many people may really disagree with in this, in this room. But I actually believe that very often people who want to climb Everest or want to do something like that, they are, it is very self-enhancing. And I'm not sure that it's so good for them in the long run. What has been found in a couple of studies now is that these types of athletes, whether they're ultra marathoners or want to climb Everest, who do it for something bigger than themselves, actually end up succeeding more. Uh, and they actually break records, they break personal records, and then they say, I didn't care about that personal record. I cared about this, yeah. this charity I was giving to, or this, this purpose that's yeah. bigger than myself. Yeah. So I do believe that a purpose is not a purpose is not a purpose. Yeah. So, so, right, okay, so sorry, I, I, I think that's great, and, and I'm thrilled to have that. Uh, and I certainly know the literature on the eudaimonic and, and hedonic happiness and how that relates yeah. to health outcomes. But the, just to hit that final thing is, again, this is personal experience it can be partially, at least partially constructed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I yeah. don't believe that there was one thing I was meant to do that was going to transform right. my life. When look at Bill Gates, you mentioned him. You know, he's made he's zillions, involved. billions of dollars, but he probably did it in part so that he could create the Gates Foundation, right? Yeah. So that's cool. I mean, you can make money. That's not purely <coughs> selfish sure. if you have self-transcending concepts around that money. So Ron, I want to come back to you. So. So this notion, right, so you have these, you know, helicopter parents and tiger moms, we're all you know, focused on doing everything we need to make our kids successful. But I think you know, one of the things you point out is we may not be doing them any favors in their, in their goal if we're going to develop grit in these kids. And I, you, know, how much, you know, how much do we let our kids struggle and how, when do we know when to back off? Well. You know, I think you bring up a really good point, and there's been much written about, you know, the failure of the helicopter parenting school. Um, and, you know, I think there's some practical things that we can do. So one of the things, you know, I always like to, to say is let your kids fall, which is different than failing. You know, there's a, 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 an old Yiddish proverb about the, you know, the beauty of the skin knee how we learn from those failures, those little failures, the ones that we can correct. And those, they are a gift to us. And by protecting our children and never letting them fall, we insulate them. And I, you know, we've heard much about the millennial generation who I actually think, you know, they're very gutsy, they have a lot of initiative, they just don't have all the resiliency and tenacity that perhaps they need. Um, so it's important to do that. Um, I think it's and also. And by the way, it takes real guts to do that, it, doesn't it? It, it, it takes a lot of guts to do that because you know, not protect your child, not yeah, put a ball around them. It's very hard. Um, uh, or or here's, here's another one. Um, you know, I learned this. Um, there's a great story from the Navy SEALs. When you uh, get trained to be a Navy SEAL, when you show up, the very first thing you are taught, and these are the the baddest, toughest, um, you know, warriors. In, in, our, in our nation, um, they crawl through the mud and the midnight swims and all that, but what is the first thing you get taught to do? You get taught to make your bed. And the reason you get taught to make your bed is because the, the belief goes is if you do get up every morning and you do one perfect thing, and that sets you up for more success during the day, you will take that success and build on it. And if by chance you have a horrible day, you will come home to that one perfectly made bed that will reinforce your abilities and set you up for a better tomorrow. So, you know, I always tell parents, have your kids make their beds. Give them chores. Or, I mean, the last thing that I think has been shown through a lot of evidence is do not help them with their homework. It is one thing to make them do their homework. It is another thing to do it for them. And what the research shows actually is that kids whose parents help them do their math homework, actually do worse in math. Not just because they're not doing their work, because parents, what they're communicating to them is, oh, math is very hard. You clearly can't do math by yourself. You need somebody else. And they project all their anxiety about math onto kids who get the message that, gee, this is really hard. I probably can't do that. Related to that, there's a study that, that with kids that they were all taking these STEM courses, you know, the science, technology, math courses, and half of them were assigned to just spend half an hour thinking about the toughest problems in the world and what they would want to do to solve those problems. Yeah. And then they, they did much better. And, and I think, Vivian, you were referring to that study. But that, 
so I would say maybe not help them, but help them produce the why of the class. Yep. Why are you doing this? So we just have a few minutes left before we, believe it or not, before we go to the audience for audience questions. So I hope you have your questions written down. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the sort of the more quantitative part of it from both you and Vivian. So, so you've taken this notion of purpose and you've somehow, you know, built it into an app that, that uses big data to track, just how does that work? Yeah, I'll talk about it actually in the pavilion after okay. this a little later, but um, just real quickly, we're using big data such as, well, first of all, Aristotle didn't say just have a purpose and now you can go to Disney World. He said, you should be aligned with your purpose every day. And to do that, he talked about energia or energy and he talked about will or willpower. And those two things, imagine having wind in your sails, having a rudder, but having this harbor, this purpose that you need to sail to. And so we've studied what gives you more energy and willpower. And it's what I call space, sleep, presence, activity, creativity, and eating. Uh, but in addition, we know the weather contributes to this. We know that the economy does, uh, news events do. If your sports team loses, you eat, if your NFL team loses, you eat 16% more saturated fat the next day. No, that's true. Well, and if they win, well, you eat 9% less. one of my colleagues uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, it's actually worse than that. Yeah, sure. well, <laughs> you know, so anyway, uh, all of these things. So we can use big data, and we're working with Booz Allen Hamilton, actually, who collects you know, a lot of big data, and they're, they also know how to process this, and down to a local level, so every single day, we know, based on a predictive model that we can create about you, which of those influences you the most, and you will be different than you, or you, or you, and then we also look at how well you slept, how present, active, creative, and how well you've been eating, and we can connect with these sort of things, over 150 biometric devices, and then we give you a prediction of what makes you tick and what'll happen and what you could do about it to improve energy and willpower and be better connected and aligned with your purpose. Yeah. And so I know Vivian, you're, you're, you, so you've, you can actually measure people in their natural state. And, you know, how do you get that data and, what, and then what do you do with it? How does it? How I would say, work? by the way, I, I, Given what you'd said earlier, when you've been asked about big data and you started yeah. talking about Aristotle, I thought you were going to talk about how he talked about big data. <laughs> and, uh, you know, oh, the, yeah, right. The Buddha talked about big data. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I, so let me take you through a little narrative. Yeah. Um, so the first two kids ever signed up for our service were my two kids. So my daughter's five and a half, and uh, she ends her day by drawing a bunch of pictures. Or, so I go pick her up. I snap a photo to share with her grandmother because she loves those things. The CC Muse, which is the name of the system. That photo of what she created, it could be a costume, it could be Legos, it could be a picture, comes in here on the deep scary side, some AI, deep neural networks start analyzing that image. I then go pick up my son. He's uh, eight and he's just finished third grade. He tells me stories. I hit a button on the app, I grab 30 seconds of him talking or maybe five minutes of us reading a book together later in the day. Streams to me. This is just a natural part of what these kids are doing in their lives. Again, AI start analyzing this data. On top of that, once a day, and that's totally voluntary, once a day the system asks me a single question. Uh, in secret, behind the scenes, it's actually predicting every parent's answer to thousands and thousands of questions. And then it figures out if I knew the true answer to one question about Felix, which one would help me the most? Not just understand Felix, but all the other kids like Felix. So if they're two very similar kids in the system, they <coughs> automatically get asked very different questions. Um, turns out, after a couple of weeks, we have really solid predictions of every parent's answer to every question. Uh, so what do we do with this? Sorry. Our goal is this very minor ambition. We want to literally predict kids' life outcomes. Now, the worst thing I could do with that, and let me be very clear, because when we talk about grit and we talk about uh, mindset and a lot of this other research, people have tracked that throughout kids' lives. You can say, if you wait this long before you eat the marshmallow in the famous marshmallow experiment, you will live this much longer. You'll go this much further yeah. in your education. You'll make yeah. this much more money. Willpower. Exactly. So we, um, uh, we leverage all of that. And if we wanted to, we could tell you, this is how long, in an actuarial sense, yep. this is how long your kid's going to live. Here's how far they're going in education. Here's how much money they're going to make. Here's how happy they'll be. Instead, 
we send a single additional message. Here's the one thing you can do tonight that will have the biggest impact in your child's life. Every night, a 20 to 30 minute activity, I sure hope you at least spend that amount of time with your kids anyways. Um, for someone like me, of course, that built it, it's, I know it's high impact. I know that this is the right thing for Felix tonight. For another mom that may not have a couple PhDs and a spouse who also is, researches this, it's just simply the insight. Right now, here's what you should do. Um, so that's the core. We collect yep. massive data sets, uh, and much like my 122 million person set, but our goal is to turn it all the way down. This ma massive data set to predict life outcomes and to turn it into one little action to do right now. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Thank yeah. you. And, cool? and, and I just said, just to not to steal our thunder, <laughs> but you know, this is a, a radical departure, of course, from the way we evaluate kids in school and attempt to predict their futures through well, testing and standardized tests and so forth. Testing and grades just don't. They don't. Yeah. They're amongst the various variables people have researched. Uh, look at. Um, 10,000 West Point cadets uh, tracked over a 10-year period post-graduation. Grades perfectly by design, predict graduation rank. No predictive value for what rank they would attain later in the Army. Um, I use the language of endogenous motivation, but it's, truth is it's this melange of these sort of motivational and, and grit things that is strongly predictive of both graduation and terminal rank attainment, award accumulation, how long to stick it out. One additional nuance, exogenous motivation, tests, you want to do it to impress your friends, to make your parents happy, you're afraid of getting kicked out, negative predictor of both graduation and final rank uh, Interestingly, Google, which is you know, famous for testing and being um, very, very um, restrictive on where did you go to school, what, were, what was your grade point average, has realized that it's absolutely not predictive of success within Google, they have stopped asking, they've stopped asking where you went to school, what your grade point average of Ernst and Young used to do the same yep. thing, have found the absolute same data. It is absolutely <clears throat> irrelevant. So with that, I'd like to open questions up to the audience. First hand up, ready to go, front wow. row here. <laughs> so you're quick on the trigger there. You should be in jeopardy or something. Here comes awesome. the mic right here. What? Mic right There's the you. mic. My name's Madeline Levine. Um, the, the, the title of this is Secrets of Successful Kids. And um, one of the things I'd like, I have a two-part question, I'm sorry, but one of the things I'd like to know is most of the examples ended up being about extremely high-performing um, kids, and you're all high-performing people. So I think one of the issues that parents really struggle with is being able to see success as a broader constellation of things in their children's lives. So when you talk about grit, you know there is a lot of controversy about whether or not grit is a trait um, that is teachable or is it really a skill that can be learned. Can you separate out what you see as the components of grit into what's a, you know, part of the big five and what part of it is um, actually a teachable skill? Well, um, we actually believe that it is teachable um, that we all sort of have innate levels, but most of these, these sort of traits can be developed. Um, that's why I said before, what's interesting is when uh, we developed a, a scale, it's been validated by a clinical psychologist and some uh, fairly lengthy um, evaluation process. And what's really interesting is um, no matter who you give the test to, um, about two-thirds of people will score pretty high. So the, I think the issue is how do you develop it and how do you start rewarding kids for the things that grit, for instance, is. Mm -hmm. So w resilience is a very, very important characteristic. How do you start rewarding kids, not so much for their successes, but for how they pick themselves up? So when a kid brings home a bad test score, how do you say, um, you know what, that's, you know, I see that you tried really hard. How are you going to study more next time so that we start incentivizing that? Or this notion of tenacity, right? Um, you know, we give our kids all these activities to do and we let them flip from activity to activity, which is fine. We're, they're exploring their passions and we want them to find one that sticks. 
But I always say, don't let your kid quit swimming or piano lessons or whatever it is on their worst day. Because then all you've done is reinforce this notion of you don't have to stick with something if you don't like it. So I think there are lots of ways that we can train people. Yes, some of us are more naturally gritty than others, the marshmallow test, right? But I think if you ate the, marshmallow, if you ate the marshmallow, you're not doomed. Is, is the message that I, <laughs> so, I would have eaten the marshmallow. So I, I want to really get into that. So I've become a, 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 I started life as a neuroscientist, a theoretical neuroscientist, and then through some of my companies, I've started studying labor economics. Now I brought those two together, and there's a field called neuroeconomics. And here is a nuance to the marshmallow test that most people don't appreciate. And I mean this as a direct answer to your question. So if you're not familiar with it, put a marshmallow in front of a little kid at about age four. Uh, Three-year-olds, they'll all eat it right away. Um, and you tell them, you'll be back in 10 minutes. If you don't eat the marshmallow, I'll give you a second one. Um, every kid eats the marshmallow in the end. It's just how long it takes before they break. By the way, some of them last 20 minutes, which means you lied to them and you didn't come back in 10 minutes. Um, here's the, the secret of the marshmallow test that people don't know. This is true of every famous experiment you've ever heard of. There's a thousand variants of them. There are variants of the marshmallow test where I can get every kid to wait, and I can get every kid to eat the marshmallow right away. What do I manipulate? Things like their trust in the adults in the room. And I will nuance it this way. It is their belief that their hard work will pay off. Um, so one thing that I think binds together our discussion of uh, these high-performing kids that are sort of, we're structuring their lives, we're overstructuring them and trying to get stuff them into Harvard, and kids who are just trying to make a difference and get them out of whatever terrible, you know, spiraling situation they're in. What is true amongst all of them is this belief that their hard work will pay off. For some kids, why do I need to work hard? It always pays off. And maybe it's because my parents always do it for me. Uh, but for another one, it is, I will contend, a rational belief that their hard work won't pay off. You want kids to be gritty, and this is not a trivial thing, easy to fix, but I think it can be addressed. You want kids to be gritty, we need to actually have a world where being gritty really makes a difference in their life. Yeah. Um, next, I want to move yeah. on to the next question. Uh, all right, right here. Microphone. Thanks, Nick. No problem. Um, I have a personal question for Vivian. You lived in a car. You flunked out of high school and college. What did your parents do while you were going through this? They stuck with me through all of this time. Um, in fact, the main reason I didn't kill myself is that I didn't want to hurt them. Um, and, uh, and they were amazing. Unfortunately, they just didn't know what to do. People often ask me, so I build all these predictive models. What could your models possibly have told your parents? Right? Early in life, it should have predicted something wonderful. Then by 25, it should have predicted that I wouldn't be alive at 30. How could it possibly? Well, how about everything's going to be OK? Just everyone was so obsessed with whether I would live up to this ideal that they'd set for me. Um, and that turned out to be completely wrong for me. Uh, I needed some time to grow. So th this, is, this is the thing. They were wonderful, uh, and it just it took something bigger than me and my personal story to, to get out of that car. Gentleman in the back. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, how universal are these generalizations? Uh, how much variability is there across income groups, yeah. religion, Great culture, question. and even across time? And uh, maybe you can illuminate a little can bit. Can I Victor, take, take that? Take yeah. That um, just so happens that in this conference, my other daughter, Rachel is here, and Rachel Strecker works uh, at the Aspen Institute, and she's one of the program managers of the New Voices program that goes to Sub-Saharan Africa. She had no as influence well on others. his selection for the panel, by the way. Just yeah, so. and uh, yeah. but she brings some of the most impressive people I have ever spoken with, uh, who have tremendous purpose and have also grown up under some of the most difficult situations I've ever heard of. People who have been hit by a car at an early age and become a paraplegic. Other AIDS orphans who walk 300, uh, walk 300 miles with their grandmother to get an education in Kampala. Uh, stories like that tell me that purpose is important to everybody. This one individual who's a New Voices scholar, uh, James, who you know, um, Aranatwe, who said purpose 
is um, it gives you hope. And uh, it's not, you may think in the West that purpose is just for, for people who have everything else. It's not. And in fact, one of my doctoral students just completed her dissertation in inner city Detroit among uh, African-American adolescents, and she looked at the, the communities that people lived in. She found that the toughest communities generated the greatest purpose in these children. So the kids with the strongest purpose in their lives also lived in the toughest, craziest uh, neighborhoods. Now, we don't typically think that way, do we? Um, this is not at the top of the pyramid. It's an essential. So a real quick nuance, though. So we're in talks with the Mandela Foundation about distributing our service for free throughout the townships in South Africa and expanding from there. Anyone want to help with that, let me know. But, um, yeah. but there's this great research. Uh, it, it went on 25 years ago. It was social workers in Kingston, Jamaica, would go to the homes of severely at-risk toddlers in the Kingston area. So this is pretty hardcore um, life. And for one hour a week, they would play little games, not with the kids, but with the parents. Yeah. The, teach the parents to play games to develop the cognitive and emotional strength of the kids. It ran two years, and then it ended. Budget ended, is done. 20 years passed. Group of economists in UC Berkeley, University of Chicago, go down, study these kids, now adults. They earn 25% more than their at-risk peers, economically indistinguishable from the general population, followed up by some health psychologist friends of mine, lower cortisol levels. These kids will literally yep. live longer. Yep. If you want to hear more so, examples of this, though, tomorrow, 5 o'clock, here in the Jerome, undaunted, uh, it's these New Voices fellows. They're unbelievable. Lady back there uh, with the hat. Hi. We've been talking a lot about giving systematic ways for, to teach kids grit. Can we do the same to teach adults grit? Yes, you know, actually, one of the chapters in, in our book, Grit, Grit to Gray, is uh, titled No Expiration Date. Because um, I think there is this sense that, you know, you get to a certain point and you can't change or you can't develop grit. Um, um, but there's actually quite a lot of research about older people being able to develop um, all of these same characteristics. And I think you know, one of the interesting things about grit is actually, if you look at it, is it's sort of like a um, uh, upside down. I talked about, a lot of people talk about millennials as not being gritty. They actually have a lot of guts, a lot of um, initiative, but not as much resilience and tenacity. When you look at older people, it sort of reverses. Lots of resilience because of life lessons, um, tenacity because you just sort of develop more patience. Um, and the ability to stick with things over a long time, but less confidence in taking on um, a scary challenge, um, less confidence in doing something new. So um, you know you have to just sort of reverse the equation a little bit. Um, and you know I often tell my own story in this. So I, I you know had this long career in advertising. It was successful. Um, you know lots of um, uh, rewards from that. And two and a half years ago, I was presented with this opportunity to completely change my life, to leave the for-profit world, leave advertising, leave New York, and go to Washington, run a nonprofit, which I knew nothing about, um, leave advertising, leave New York. Um, and that was a very, very scary thing um, that actually took a lot of grit, I have to say, to go do that. So you know, I think you can find lots of um, opportunities for older people to build grit. I always like to say it's you don't retire, you rewire. Um, retirement is one of the worst concepts ever. Um, if you, if, and I think that's part of what takes the grit out of people, the sense of, you know, I'm 65 or I'm 62 or whatever age it is and you're done. If you actually go back in history, like up until the mid um, 20th century, you don't even find the word retire used a lot. Um, it wasn't a concept. It was actually invented by the Germans during the Great Depression. They, um, you know, people rioting in the streets. Young people couldn't get jobs. What did they figure out to do? Well, we'll just push the old people out so we can give young people jobs. And of course, we know how well that worked. So, <laughs> yeah. so great uh, gentleman right here, gray shirt on. Thanks. So you're all in agreement that test scores don't matter, that grades don't matter. But how do you actually parent that? 
like your kid comes home with bad grades, bad test scores, I just, it doesn't seem reasonable that you would say to your kid, your eight-year-old kid, that doesn't matter, the science says it doesn't matter, right? So, so, so what do you guys do personally? That's what my kid told me that, actually. The right? science doesn't matter. You know, you know, so, the, you know, this is hard. As someone that is not a big fan of homework, either back in the day or nowadays, <laughs> I'm some, somehow supposed to crack the whip and make certain my kids get their homework done. And in the sense that I want them to do it, even though they don't want to, and build grit, is one thing. Um, so here is something. My son has type 1 diabetes. Um, <laughs> And we frequently will see some bad numbers on his blood glucose meter. But here's the culture in the diabetes community. There are no bad numbers. Oh, 400, I'm so glad we did a check. Now we know that there's a problem. And when we can do something, like mm -hmm. everything is a learning and growing experience. So it's, of course, it's not that I want, I mean, some of this is very facile descriptions. A Harvard degree doesn't predict very much once I know a bunch of other things about you, but if it's the only thing I know, it's a stock pool. Like, it's great if you're going to hire, hire at Harvard if that's all you knew. Um, but they're, they're admitting for the same thing you're hiring for. You want to know what the actual causal factors are. Um, and the actual causal factor isn't that someone got good grades. It's that they love math. It isn't that they know how to factorize a polynomial. It's that they're thinking about what does that actually mean? And that goes on throughout life. I remember taking the first course I ever took on differential equations, and you just memorize a whole bunch of solutions. And it, I got a decent score in the class, but it, it just seemed so pointless. Then I became, started working in theoretical neuroscience, and we'd have the, we have these differential models of how the brain works, and suddenly it had meaning for me. I've never gone back and taken another class, but I'm essentially an applied mathematician nowadays. So, don't focus on the grades. Like, you look at them, you acknowledge them. Same way you look at the, uh, the drawing that your daughter made, don't say, oh, it's so beautiful. You just say, oh, it's a flower and there's yellow petals. So what is it you actually want to come out of this? Uh, you know, you want to understand what's going to drive the outcome. And it's not cracking the whip on getting a better score. It's what is this going to make this subject resonate with you? Um, so that's a fairly, it's not a deep, like, I'm not answering a specific thing you can do today, yeah. but that's the heart so of we're it. Kinda, we're kinda, so we're going to go into lightning round now. So I want to get as much questions <laughs> as we have. So I'd like your, your <clears throat> panel to keep them really brief. So lady in the back has been waiting a long time. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. So we've been talking about how children can develop more grit, how parents can parent to that. What about systems? I mean, I think that we can look at the education system, elementary school, et cetera. How do we get more in the system that does it since parents can only go so Who far? Who are you addressing that to? Are you addressing you that to anybody? Lightning round. I, I was Very good. whomever wants it. All right. Whoever wants that. Who wants that? Well, I think it's, I think it's, it's, some, it's some of the same answers, right? So how do we incentivize teachers, right? not to be teaching to a test score, right? How do we create a system where the score isn't the evaluation method for the teacher so that you know, they can spend time on character development with their classroom? So I'm a technology person, so my very quick answer is I build AIs, augmented intelligence. Wouldn't it be great if you were a teacher to know ahead of time how your decisions were gonna affect the outcomes for a specific child? Uh, then you could be the person that were making the difference, but you could leverage the kind of data that people like us can collect. Great. Um, this lady right here. You. Yeah. Dr. Ming, uh, you were speaking of this program that you were talking about. Is this just an experimental program? I'm a psychologist. I would love to use it with my clients. Will uh, it come into you being? You can show up at SoCoastLearning.com and learn all about Muse. Uh, we distribute it philanthropically, but it's available to the public as well. Yep. Lady right there. So I'm a teacher and um, amongst teachers here. Cool. Um, and I'm curious about the educational settings that you ha would, would choose for your kids now, K through 12, or do, um, and why? Oh, sorry, the educational settings that our kids yeah. are in? Yeah. 
Uh, both of my kids are in a uh, Mandarin Immersion Charter School called Yu Ming in Berkeley, California, because that's how we roll in Berkeley. Um, and uh, they're great, and my wife and I regularly, as you might imagine, with a Mandarin Immersion School, there are some serious, like, my kids are not getting enough homework, and they're not taking enough tests, uh, and we battle that pretty hard. Can you take this? Yeah, I'm sorry, my, my back to this group over here. And um, disadvantaged, I, I apologize. I just want to say but it's that. developed grip in you, though, I think. <laughs> I have grip. Yeah. Um, we developed reading and writing and decoding software based on grit. And it has transformed so many urban children, so many regular private school children, because everything gives them an awesome or a good grade. They get a grade, you know, which people are afraid of, but they go for the A plus now rather than. Um, just rushing through things. And principals are tell a principal called me yesterday and said that fifth graders signed a petition and they came to her office because they were spending too much time on graduation rehearsal and not enough time on Mac Scholar. And these were kids who never wanted to read. So I feel one way to develop grit is a child feeling successful. And success will build success. And I think that we need to differentiate our instruction in education so and make it multi-sensory enough so that the children have an opportunity to feel success because you're not going to go on a tennis court eight hours a day if you never hit the ball. We have to figure out what is the key to all of these beautiful children. So I wanted to share it. So this aligns with this idea of, of having people believe that their hard work will pay off. And, and, and I think it holds true inside of companies as well. I talk about engineering environments for success. Lady way in the back there, yep. Here, I'll do you next, okay? Thank you, this is for anyone. Um, what do you think about giving a grade for grit? I teach fifth grade and our principal read uh, Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck and we all read it too and so we actually grade perseverance. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, do, does it become more of an external motivation? Like what you do you think about giving? You want a good thing, <laughs> build a test for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's our answer. I, I, I think it's good to evaluate. Mm -hmm. um, I would never communicate to a child this lady right here. a grit score. Yep. You, had, you had your hand up. Yep. Right, you, yep. I work with youth that have come out of foster care. We provide housing and life skills. The biggest problem is what you're talking about. Those kids are resilient, but they can't persevere and they don't understand what they have inside. <clears throat> Excuse me, that actually got them into a program. We try to tell them, you're smart because you're here. Yep. But this, these things you're talking about, this would be life-saving. Yep. I, I just want to so, know if anybody could help us communicate better to this population that they still have value and they could accomplish something. All right. So I think we're pretty much at the end. Oh, one more person over here because I've neglected that part of the room for so long. Sorry. Oh, my credit cards. And everything. I'll take the American Express. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm going to be a little bit of a cynic for a moment just to yeah. play devil's advocate to something. Um, as you were talking about um, hard work paying off, which we all want to believe it does, I was thinking of the movie Waiting for Superman, which I'm Oh, guessing. let me stop you right there. <laughs> well, I just wrote an op-ed. Well, well, let, let, let her finish. Let her finish. Well, her I know where she's going. Let's let her go there. Let's, 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 let's let her go there. So anyone who hasn't seen it, um, it's basically a film about public school kids who work extremely hard, but at the end of the day, life isn't fair. You see these kids who come from unimaginable circumstances, who ma managed to get straight A's, and um, at the end of the day, they're faced with a lottery. It's totally a matter of chance which one of these kids gets to go on to better education and which ones don't. So my question for you, and not to be negative, but life isn't fair, right? I, I have a child who put a lot of time and work into something and um, did, really did everything she could, and she ended up not doing well 
and she was crushed. And I wanted to say your effort mattered, because it did, and she really tried, and I wanted to do what you're suggesting as a parent. But sometimes life isn't fair. How do you help a child pick up and move on when the lottery doesn't work out in their favor, when um, they try really hard and it, things don't go well? I mean, it's, these, these answers are not yeah. simple. So I think that's an important lesson in, um, in GRIT. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think gets misunderstood about grit is that it's like being like an oak tree, right? Strong, rigid, but actually I think it's more about learning how to, you know, I always like to say bend like bamboo and be flexible and the importance of plan B and, and you know, the, the understanding that life isn't fair and then in fact one of the things that we need to teach is that and that the resiliency that comes from that and then how you pivot. So, let me, let me, though, address, because actually, uh, I think there's a wild misunderstanding in what I was saying. Life isn't unfair. I did a series of research. If your name is Jose versus Joe, that costs you three quarters of a million dollars if you're hoping to get a job in the tech industry. You have to have a master's degree to be competitive with someone with no degree whatsoever. If you're a woman, we've calculated that number as well. So when I was saying we need to create the belief that the hard work would pay off, I probably misrepresented it. I meant we need to create a belief that their hard work will pay off by creating a world in which it actually will. Because when I said earlier they are rationally, not, they are rationally eating mm -hmm. that, that marshmallow right mm -hmm. away, it's because adults don't come back and bring you second marshmallows. It, you know, th this is a rational decision. I don't, I don't think that teaching people work hard no matter what. Work hard, uh, sorry, it's not gonna pay off you. Sorry, women, you're never actually gonna reach the C-suite or you're gonna have to work three times as hard to get there, but just stick with it because, uh, no, we need to make a change where their hard work will pay off. In Silicon Valley, if uh, our line is, the world is a meritocracy. And, uh, and anyone can be amazing. That's not good enough. Everyone can be amazing. We're all different, and, and genetics and epigenetics bring very different things to the table for everyone. But if we don't own the fact that every time someone doesn't succeed, we've failed, then we aren't really trying to change a big problem. All right, so with that, I'd like to conclude our panel. Uh, very animated uh, uh, questions and answers. We really appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, some of us will be able to re remain afterwards if you have other questions for panelists. I think Vic okay. has to go. But. I